Thank you very much, John, and thank you all for inviting me here today um, to UCL's Data for Pol Policy Conference. Um, I'm an ex-LSE student, and I'm still a governor of LSE, actually, um, but I have, um, over the last 10 years, watched with uh, increasing admiration the status of UCL across the world grow, um, and I, I'm, I'm just so impressed with all the research that you do across such a broad range of subjects, and it's a privilege to be here today. Um, and I was uh, told about some of the Nobel pr um, Prize winners that emanate from this august um, institution. And the most recent, I believe, was Professor John O'Keefe, who made the remarkable discovery of the human brain's inner GPS. And I thought about the process for discovering such a thing. Um, and you start with a hypothesis based on previous knowledge, and you experiment, and ultimately, the proof is in the new data gathered. I wasn't quite sure, looking back to the old map reading days, whether I actually had much of an inner GPS myself, um, but happily, in the days of satnav, one no longer has to admit to not being able to read a map. It struck me that most policy, in fact, is based on hypothesis, and, and we want to achieve this, we want to do that, and for the most important questions, we don't know with certainty that we will get the desired outcomes. And as always, there is the law of unintended consequences that bedevil policy making. So we must use all the data available to make the best possible hypotheses um, out of which we believe we can get the best quality policy making. And this is actually one of the reasons that I am such um, an enthusiast for machine learning and data analysis because it will overcome, in the end, the subconscious bias and the deliberate bias that infects so much policy making, um, where people are so attached to the outcome they want that over time they will select the research, bend the research, spin the research, um, and I try to fight that in myself, but when you really believe in something, it can be hard. So many government policies touch on particularly sensitive areas, health, po uh, policing, justice, and so forth. And therefore, the desire to get it right, the need to get it right, is, is all the more so. And the data, of course, is especially valuable to policy making. But much of it is personal data, which is protected by data protection law and represents also a value that citizens have and a regard for it that, of course, we have to consider. And the glib uh, remarks I've heard from senior people in some of the social media companies about how privacy is dead, I think um, the Cambridge Analytica storm put pay to that once and for all. Um, so I really admire your conference theme today. Open data emerged as a priority among G7 governments roughly 10 years ago. And we in the UK have been regarded as a leader um, right from the start. And this is due to a number of initiatives, including the development of Find Open Data, the Open Government Partnership National Action Plans, and the introduction of the Open Government Licence. We believe that open data is a force for good, and that opening up government data citizens has meant that innovative new businesses can start and grow. For example, City Mapper works because the developers have open access to the open data. And open data has also been useful for companies to build upon. Illustreets is a web app that overlays data about crime, education, transport, and more to an interactive app. Um, and they work because they can use open data sets for information about traffic and geography. And these innovations provide immediate value for citizens. And the benefits, of course, go beyond the economic case. Opening up data allows citizens to hold institutions to account and ensure that, that decisions are being made in a way that um, are capable of scrutiny and wider understanding. And publishing open data goes hand in hand with open policy making as ways of involving the public in the process of government. And the availability of data has also helped us to operate more efficiently. 
the big lottery data, for instance, has enabled a much better understanding of how well teams are doing at getting money into priority areas, how a local voluntary sector is funded, and where there is underinvestment. So it's clear that open data brings great benefits, but we have a duty of care to citizens to make sure that the data is properly used. So the tools which allow us to use data in powerful new ways are giving rise to complex, fast-moving and far-reaching economic and ethical issues. Increasingly sophisticated algorithms can glean powerful insights which can be deployed in ways that influence the decisions we make um, and target the services um, and resources that we deploy. So as the technology develops, new economic models are emerging with data at their core. So we must think about how best to in incentivize and facilitate innovative, efficient and fair use of data. And we must do more than think, we must be able to respond quickly to issues as they arise. And that's why at the end of last year we established the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation with a remit to incorporate ethical principles and identify the measures needed to strengthen and improve the way that AI and data is used. And the centre will advise government on how we can best address gaps in our regulation while supporting innovation. The UK benefits already from a world-class regulatory regime. The Information Commissioner's Office does an amazing job of promoting openness by public bodies whilst at the same time safeguarding the data privacy rights of citizens. The Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation will build on all this by making sure we understand and respond rapidly to the evolving way in which data is impacting our lives. Increasing access to data can help people, communities and organisations make better and more timely decisions, such as which energy supplier to use, the route a bus should take, or whether to invest in a new product. But the data required to make these decisions may be sensitive. The data subject may not want the data shared. Malicious and sometimes plain incompetent use of data has been much in the news. So we face a dual um, challenge to increase access to data whilst building trust in its security. And as I'm sure everybody in this room knows, there is no silver bullet. So at the moment, the UK government is piloting data trusts. These are legal structures which provide independent third-party stewardship of data for the benefit of a group of organisations or people. Data trusts operate by allowing multiple individuals or organisations, such as supermarkets, conservation charities or local authorities, to, gain, to give some control over data to a new body, the trust, so that it can be used to create the benefits either for themselves or other people, or ideally both. And in this room, we all know the value of sufficiently open and shared medical data. Diseases can be diagnosed earlier, um, medicines more efficiently prescribed, and ultimately, lives saved. But research often shows that individuals are understandably unwilling for their medical data to be shared between organisations, even organisations that work together within the NHS. So alarm bells understandably rung last week when Trump was here um, and stated that the NHS was on the table in a future trade deal. And he quickly um, withdrew that. Um, but it's all very well considering the NHS just in terms of companies based abroad um, vying for procurement contracts, which is, I think, the context in which that remark was understood but lesser understood, perhaps, was the potential for large technology companies to work with the NHS and have access to data which, albeit anonymized, gives huge economic potential value because the NHS is well known for being one of the biggest data sets covering healthcare in the world, if not the biggest. So there's difficult questions to which people have yet to find the answer. But the newly established NHX, which, which um, the new Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, um, and Matthew Gould, who was until a couple of weeks ago responsible for running half of my department, um, will be working hard to find technology-based solutions to make sure that we can realise the immense value of that NHS data set in an ethical manner, which safeguards the privacy of patients, but also 
the interests of UK taxpayers. So ultimately, we must continue working to create a legislative and business environment that promotes the sharing of data within a robust framework based on privacy. 90% of data was created in the last two years. That's an incredible statistic and um, makes the prediction of the future um, extremely challenging. The continued effective use of data has the power to be truly transformative for the entire world and we have a duty to ensure this transformation is positive. So we must make sure we're exploiting data to continue the, to improve the lives of every citizen. And the UK government takes this charge incredibly seriously and also behoven on the government to really listen and learn from the high quality research that is being done all the time in institutions like UCL. So thank you very much, Zeynep, for organising the conference and for inviting me here to take part in some of it with you. Thank you.